everybody, and welcome to the Cinema Simon Podcast. All on video and also on the audio as well. <laughs> you have been hypnotized by us. <laughs> welcome to the Nerd Zone. <laughs> yes. I am John Thompson. I am the action and animation expert. I am Garrett. I am the uh, indie film and drama expert. I am Matthew, one of the superhero and sci-fi experts. Dylan and Paul will be here in a little bit. Yep. Um, just I think it's just some car troubles going on or something. So, yep. yep. That'll be, um, they'll be here later. Yes. But for now, it'll just be us. Yes. Welcome to our new episode, everybody. Hope you had a great week, and uh, we hope you get to join our latest episode that we're doing for tonight. Yeah, tonight we are discussing some of the greats in cinematography. Cinematography. Thank you. (laughs) My mouth is not working right now. (laughs) That's right. Dude, I've been having sinus problems, like, for the past few days. Like, my, I, it's, it's allergy season now, and, um. Yes. It's not that I have like, because clearly you can hear me now. I sound fine. Like I'm not, I'm not going like that every few seconds. I'm not like stuffy. It's just the congestion in my head. It's causing me like pressure in my head right now. It's, it sucks. But at least I'm not uh, blowing my nose every yeah. few seconds. I don't know what my issue is. I I don't think it's been since. I think it's been since COVID because I don't think I noticed it beforehand. But I've been having a lot of trouble like pronouncing words lately. Eh. Um, I've been on my, on top of my allergy mess and all, all month, so it's, it's helped me out a lot. I mean, it is springtime. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I'm allergic to fresh cut grass, so all summer is just a nightmare. Yep. <laughs> I, I guess I'm already allergic to dust. <laughs> we're allergic to you. Wait, what? Hey, wait a <laughs> second. <laughs> but, um, yeah, we're going to be talking about the great in cinematography, but, uh, let's get started with what we've seen for the first time this week. Uh, I will start. Uh, okay. <clears throat> So, uh, I am in the middle. I didn't have enough time to finish it before I came here. Um, I am about almost done watching the new Roadhouse movie with Jake Gyllenhaal. Um, so far, it's decent fun. Now, I haven't seen the original Roadhouse, so I don't really have anything to compare it to. I haven't seen it either. Um, so, I'm I'm not sure how it compares to the original Um this this new roadhouse, as far as I'm concerned, is it's very campy, um, and it it purposely has a lot of dumb, just over the top shit, especially with Conor McGregor's performance as the villain, which is just he plays. It's, it's not a good performance, but it, it is kind of fascinating to watch. You, you um, kind of got me intrigued. Um, Conor McGregor is, as the he's villain. not a good actor um, at all. But <laughs> he, is it like a typical like '80s performance, like '80s action kinda, movie? Yeah, like if the villain. The '80s villains who were on like cocaine. <laughs> it's kind. It's kind of like that. Um, Gyllenhaal is 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 pretty enjoyable to watch. I love Gyllenhaal, and it's not the type of performance I usually see from him in like a like an action movie like this. So it is kind of fun to see him in it, and he's got a lot of he's got a lot of dry sense of humor to him. Um, and I'm not sure if that's what Patrick Swayze. Schwazy did in the original film or <clears throat> if if it's if they took a different turn with this new one um but it it is enjoyable to watch especially the fight scenes are really great it's directed by Doug Lyman who has directed some great stuff Edge of Tomorrow which in my opinion is one of the most underrated it's sci-fi fantastic. films I love of it. the past decade it's it's great I mean it's god it's so good um also did stuff like Born Identity and Mr. and Mrs. Smith um so the fight scenes are really great. Um, it's it has a bit of a identity crisis for it. I'm not sure if it's trying to be like a. Most of the time, I'm enjoying it. Most of the film I've enjoyed it so far as just a goofy sort of like um, a goofy little action film with good fights. But some some of the times though, it's it's kind of hard to to tell because it does take itself seriously, like. 25% of the time, so it's, it's hard to tell if it's really going for that, you know, campy tone. Um, but, I don't know, I, I still gotta finish it. I'm close to the end of it, so, yeah, we'll see how I feel about it. As of right now, it's like, I would give it a 6 out of 10. It, it's it's perf- it's a perfectly serviceable film. Just, um, I just don't think it's that great. Um, and it's as far, because Doug Lyman wanted this to come out in theaters so bad. Yeah. Um, mm. Honestly, I think it works perfectly fine as like a 
a streaming movie. And compared to like another action recent action film that is goes for more of a campy tone, um, that I think is actually better. I think it, I like the Beekeeper movie more than uh, I have not movie. seen that yet. I Beekeeper really want to see it. Is is a ridiculously dumb movie, uh, the Jason Statham movie. I've but been wanting to it watch is, that. It it is fun. I I saw that in the theater. I had a really good time watching it. I'm not gonna lie. It's it 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 feels like it's taking itself seriously sometimes, but it I think it has a better balance than this new Roadhouse movie does. And it is by uh, MGM and Amazon. So it is. It does have that thing going for it. Um, yeah. So that's my thoughts on the new Roadhouse so far. Um, another movie I rewatched recently, um, 127 Hours with James Franco. Which okay. Is an amazing movie. I have seen it. Regardless, regardless of what you think of J- about James Franco now, um, yeah. it is he. He is a a damn good actor, and that movie is just. It's it's just. Uh, exhilarating to watch if you've never seen it. Um, yeah, I need to watch it. It's, it's that. haunting. I heard it's, lots of good It's really about painful it. to watch, especially oh, I, the I ending. heard it's painful. But, um, Did he have to cut his hand or something yeah, like that in one basic, scene? True story, too. And, yeah. Um, it's, it's a great movie. Um, another movie uh, I got my sister to watch finally was Killers of the Flower Moon. Nice. Um, nice. And it's crazy because she wasn't that big on Oppenheimer. Um, she's watched it twice. She watched it uh, after it won Best Picture and he's like, I just don't see what why it, why it won i just didn't find it that interesting but <laughs> we're sorry you lo- didn't care for it she loved killers of the flower moon i she prefer loved- killers over oppenheimer um i okay. think i i think they're close together um i prefer oppenheimer a bit but i love Cl- killers of the flower moon too i think it's a terrific movie and she is now interested in watching scorsese's other movies like the cool. departed she, she asked me um she actually asked me about if i had departed on blu-ray i was like yeah i do and uh, she wants to watch that stuff which great i'm gonna try to watch the irishman in the next two weeks yeah i wonder if she I'm, i do wonder if she'll like that one um i'm not I'm, sure if she will but she i mean she was nervous about that three and a half hour runtime for killers of the flower moon and she told me she didn't have a problem with that at all it doesn't feel like that at all no, it, it does really doesn't feel that way at all uh, Oppenheimer so, well high quality movies it did feel like it dragged a little bit it, I I disagree but um yeah it, some compared people, to killers like yeah. the pacing in killers was more fast yeah paced. I, I I can see that yeah so yeah um that's that's uh my stuff that yeah. oh and yeah I do want to bring this up I'm not gonna go into full uh details on it um i did watch the quiet on set hbo max or max documentary series it is um it is about as uh as haunting as uh, a lot of people have been making it out to be um it's been making the waves this week i mean all across the internet um of course with the drake bell thing um just detailing the horrific things that are that were happening behind the scenes at nickelodeon with Dan Schneider and Brian Peck and some of the other guys who were just who were just being so horrible, um, and down um, some of them um, molesters, and I won't exactly say who, but yeah, um, it was a uh, it was a, a, a like production wise, it's not that great of a documentary, but it it is just it was a story that I think really did need to be told, and I think anyone who especially if you grew up in that era like i did who watched nickelodeon yeah like i did and watched drake and josh and you know uh the amanda bind show and um iCarly, all that stuff if you if you did watch all that stuff um i i do think you should watch it you're not gonna feel great after you watch it but i think it is i think it is necessary it's a story that needs to be told yes yeah absolutely yeah uh, i was gonna say real quickly about scorsese a couple of scorsese films i have watched before was departed and hugo which i love both hugo of. i need to watch again um it's i haven't great. watched it in a it bit great. um yeah i i do remember really liking it yeah so. i want to rewatch gangs in new york i haven't watched that in a while yeah it's a good one. i've been wanting to watch that i've seen it once yeah um, daniel day lewis man and that oh my god there was uh two points i wanted to bring up about your movies real quick um I think David Ayer gets a bad rap because of Suicide Squad. That was <laughs> David Ayer. I think um, I've said a lot of bad stuff about David Ayer. I think uh, his recent movies have been, to put it politely, messy as hell. Um, yeah, I think David Ayer did a, a really good job on The Beekeeper. Like, and didn't he do Fury yeah. too? Yeah, uh, I, I really like Fury. 
Wait, wait, and he he did he was a director of Suicide Squad that did this? Yeah. Yeah. I did um, not know that. Yeah, it's it's a fun action movie. It's it's obviously not don't take it seriously. I mean it's it feels like a Jason Statham movie you would see in the two thousands, like the transporter and stuff. So if you like that, I, I would give Beekeeper a watch. It feels like a Jason Statham solo expendables movie, kinda. Yeah, I know, I know better want... than the past two Expendables movies. I still have not watched four. Oh my god, dude! I'm scared because I uh, I love the first three. <laughs> I even oh, love the third one. Is, uh, you know what? I haven't horrendous. seen the third one yet because of how bad the fourth. I one hated is, Expendables so. three. Uh, Expendables <laughs> three sucked. My favorite's two. Mm. Yeah, my favorite's two as well. Two was really fun. And then the other point was uh, I feel like Jake Gyllenhaal's like thing is uh stuff like Nightcrawler. Yeah, Prisoner. That's, that's my favorite performance of his is Nightcrawler. Yeah, like those type of movies. It's, so I'm not sure if he was exactly like the right guy to go with for that role, but I I love Jake Gyllenhaal and I'll watch him in anything. And I think he did, did a perfectly good job in the role. So and then I don't know. last point I want to make about Jake Gyllenhaal is I guess he was the front runner before Christian Bale got the role in the Dark Knight trilogy. Makes sense. And apparently he is now one of the front runners for the DCU. Well, I mean. How old is he though? Isn't he let like me let 40s? me do my research on that. Uh, yeah, I believe he's late forties, but um, I'm just not sure if that's a. Role. It's gonna be an older Batman. Like he's gonna have Damian oh, Wayne already. Okay, then that that makes sense. Well, yeah, they're they're he, going forty three years old. Yeah, they were going for like a forty year okay. or fifties Batman. Which is actually uh, December. Which December nineteenth? That's actually uh, that's the day he was born before my birthday. Yeah, December twentieth. Yeah. So that's really cool. James, uh, Chris Pratt was born on my birthday too. Oh, cool. Um, oh, nice. <clears throat> so um, yeah. I think that perfectly makes sense then if they're going for an older Batman. Yeah, they're or, going for 40, early forties is a good age range. Yeah, uh, he, Damian Wayne's going to be in the Batman movie with him, so cool. so it will be alright. I'd be I'd be perfectly okay for some with reason. That. I could kind of see him in a Batman uniform for some yeah. reason. That John, you want to do your movies next? Uh, I'll actually go last on this one, so you go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Okay, oh, so I watched seven movies this I'm week. Not, I'm not ready to hear what you got from me. Um, <laughs> he said he had a hot take, guys, so get ready. I'll save the best for last. All right. To build okay. the anticipation. Uh, I, watched the, <laughs> I watched the Ten Commandments for the first time. I still need to watch. I, oh. I love, because I love Prince of Egypt. I know yeah. that movie's compared to a, uh, that a lot. Yeah. Uh, Prince of Egypt, I think, is one of the most underrated I love anime that one. films it's ever. Great. While the quality is obviously not as... it's. It's not as well made as it's, Passion of the Christ. I mean, it's um, it's C- Cecil B. DeMille. Like, yeah, he that he owned like 1950s epic films. Yes, yeah. so. it's not as well made as Passion of the Christ, but also it was 50 years before. Yeah, it's like a, it's that's a weird comparison. But, like in terms you know, of biblical movies. Yeah. Like, yeah, but just some some of the shots that I've seen in Ten Commandments are just stunning. Even yeah. now, for the 50s, it looked it, it was an ambitious undertaking. Yeah, and if you um. Look at adjusted for inflation. It's among the top ten highest grossing yeah. movies of all time. Yep. Um next one, I don't know what you're gonna think about this one. Um I got a lot of hate when it came out, but I actually really enjoyed it. It's actually one of my favorite movies I've seen this year for the first time. Uh The Kitchen. I really did not like that one. With Melissa McCarthy? Uh, yeah, I, I saw that in the theater. I was like the only person in the theater when yeah, that I came out. Yeah, I saw your um, I was like, wow, I, I really like I was, I was, yeah, I was thoroughly, I thoroughly disappointed because I, it looked good from the trailers. Yeah, I thought it was really I, good. Yeah, I just, it was, so, to me, it was just so dull and so boring. But yeah, I don't know why it intrigued me, and I love seeing Melissa McCarthy doing a dramatic she was pretty role. Pretty good. She yeah, was, uh, the acting was fine. It's just the hor- I just thought the writing was atrocious. Yeah, the writing was definitely the weakest part. Yeah, I feel like the acting was the strongest. Yeah, yeah, and it Nothing it just intrigued me. Um, I watched Public Enemies for the first time. Still need to watch that. Uh, it's real. The coolest. Michael, th- I'm, I'm a huge fan of Michael Mann. So. Yeah. Uh, obviously Johnny Depp is Dillinger. Christian Bale is the um FBI agent, mm-hmm. and the Ooh. fact that it was. The coolest thing was it was filmed on location in multiple things. Like, they Michael filmed Mann. where the stuff actually happened. That's a Michael Mann-ism right there. He just he yeah. loves shooting on location. Yeah, great in director. Very interesting ways. Uh, Ghostbusters Afterlife. Mm. I actually preferred it more than the original. Because I liked the original. It was a good movie. It's just not something I could rewatch a lot. It's I, just, I get that. It doesn't have the rewatchability for me. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll write the Ghostbusters movie when I do watch the other ones. Uh, the Exorcist Believer. I hated it. I Not hated literally. It. Oh, you, you didn't like it either. I hate. It was intriguing, 
But it was horrible the first, writing. The first half yeah. was fine. But the second half is where it just goes completely downhill. It was horrible writing. Uh, the acting was fine, for, especially from the two girls. Yeah. Um, the priest was a good actor. Everybody, a lot of the other actors the fa- just seemed... The dad, the dad was good, too. Yeah. A lot of the acting seemed uninspired. Yeah. And then, don't want to go too much into this, but Elements it was a theological train wreck. Like it, yeah. There was was just... the all the religions coming together like the Avengers and shit. Uh, yeah, in the name That's of all so holy stupid. beings. It, it, yeah, I'm serious. It, they literally tried to do something like that yeah. with like all the religions, like Muslims, I mean, wh- Christians. Why, why are which you is... why are you re- rebooting the Exorcist to begin with when the original was already fine? Like, what are you doing? Money. Yes, it yeah, was money. money. Uh, final two. I watched a documentary. Uh, no new kind of story. The real story of Tooth and Nail Records. Mm, nice. Uh, which, uh, if you're unfamiliar, it was an indie label from like the early '90s. Oh, okay. Uh, it was basically you had like your normal Christian labels with like the pop and stuff, and they sometimes had rock bands. But like this, this dude came out of college and he wanted to start a label for actually Christian young people, punk bands, hardcore bands, and he like started it out of his garage, and it became like one of the biggest indie labels ever. Like, they sold over, I think, 600 million copies. Nice. Wow. Uh, That's cool. Spawning bands like Under Oath, um, yeah. August Burns Red, like, huge metal bands Yeah. spawned yeah, from this yeah, label. Yeah, for seeing the raid, I, I actually want to check it out. It's on YouTube. That's where I watched it. Oh, okay. Nice. Cool. Uh, it was really interesting. And then... <laughs> okay, camera. Zoom in on Garrett. Zoom in on his reaction. Oh, boy. And they just walked in. Perfect. <laughs> they can hear this. Uh, The travesty is about to happen. Go for it. I watched The Black Phone. Oh, yeah. oh, oh boy. This was my third attempt to watch it. This was the... Oh, man. This was my first time... I, I attempted it three times. This was my first time actually finishing it. Didn't like it? I could... It bored me to death. Oh. Like, I feel, I feel like mad. it was... I, I'm not mad at that. Yeah, but... I feel like it was a good movie for what it was. It just did not interest me in the slightest. Yeah, I can see that. Um... <clears throat> yeah, I I love the black phone. The black phone, I really do. Um, <clears throat> I think it, um, I think it was a good, you know, kind of coming of age story mixed with you know a horror film. Um, because it took a lot of inspiration from like smaller, you know, it took a lot of inspiration from like kind of older retro movies from like the French New Wave, like um, Four Hundred Blows, and um, I'm a big fan of that era of filmmaking where <clears throat> it is smaller. To me, I I really loved um the the characters in it. I loved um Finn, um the main character Finn. I think the actor did such a great job. Um, love he- Ethan Hawke in that role. Um, and it's such a interesting diversion because he's usually you know Ethan Hawke is usually playing like pretty nice or either nice guys or um somewhat you know or just complex characters it's it's it was really just nice to see him play like a straight up psychopath in a movie which you know and i get a kick of that i I will give a positive note about it i did enjoy the part where he's on the phone with uh robin i think his name was Mm -hmm. his friend from the beginning of the movie yeah and he's like i'm right here with you or something like that yeah i did i did find that cool and i do prefer uh, Scott Derrickson's other horror movies. I I do really enjoy. I, I'm a huge fan of Scott Derrickson. Yeah. I I think he did a terrific job on that one too. Um, I really do enjoy as, Sinister and Exorcism. As far as scare like scariness goes, I think Sinister for me is yeah. like his scariest. It's movie definitely today. scary. Um, I mean, but I mean, it just depends on what you're looking for. Um, because Black Phone, I is, you know, it's an intense thriller in a lot of spots, but it's. I think it is more about the characters uh, and the, right. you know, is, is more about the emotions um, than, you know, something like Sinister is, which I think is just straight up, you know, we're going to take you to some dark places. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah, 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 I, yeah. I, I still really enjoy the Black Phone. Yeah. I, think I mean, personally for me, I, I kind of feel the same thing about Beetlejuice. Like, I respected and a lot of things about the movie. But it just was not for me. And how the film got a PG rated is yeah. beyond me. Nice fucking it looks, model. It looks way too dark for a kid's <laughs> movie. What the fridge? <laughs> that film would have got a PG-13. That film came out in 1988 with a yeah. PG-13 rating. It was a different time then. Yeah, um, it was. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, um, or airplanes showing bare boobs in a PG. Yep. Oh, God. <laughs> Although I did like the table scene where they were singing. That that was a good Day-o. scene. Yeah. And, Mike, yeah, and Michael Keaton was fantastic I as mean, usual. He is fucking, great. A year <clears throat> after he did that, went from that to that. Yeah. Like, one of the... Ulti- like, when I was a kid, and I, you know... I think I watched Beale just before I watched the 89 Batman. I was just, and then I, when I heard that Beetlejuice and Batman were played by the same person that literally melted my mind that someone could have that much range. What's that, Paul? It just melted my mind to think that someone could have that much range from two different performances. I personally think Michael yeah. Keaton, he's one of Mind the... Blowing. I personally think Michael Keaton, he's one of the best actors to never win an Oscar. Oh, oh God, yeah. Yes, agreed. Um, yeah, he's so great. The so ladies she... are here. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> did you not introduce yourself already? Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, the, was that all you had for the movies? Yeah, no, John and Paul and Dylan got to go. Uh, what, what were your specific criticisms with the black phone? It just didn't really interest me. That was my biggest one. You told me more in private. Yeah, you did. <laughs> uh, well, I said, I didn't. You mentioned the world building. I didn't initially mention it. No. Yeah. No, that's not what I'm talking about. What? All I remember is it didn't really interest me. I, I understand that. That's all I need. Really. Yeah, that's all I really remember. <laughs> actually, yeah, these, I mean, that's uh, understandable. Actually, these guys go ahead, then I'll go last. So. Okay. Who wants to go next? I, I mean, I need to pull up my letter box. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, 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 I can what? go ahead and just. You see it. anything this week? Uh, what did I see this week? Ghostbusters Afterlife. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think all of us did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We actually, had, we had a lot of fun watching that. I didn't, actually didn't watch Afterlife this week. I mean, I've seen it. So yeah, I enjoyed it. The ending killed me a little bit. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> made me cr- it made me totally tear- understand. Made yep. me tear up the first time I saw it. Yep. Yep. I nevertheless, so I gave it a five out of five. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. So I didn't watch a whole lot of new stuff this week. Um. I rewatched uh, the first two Ghostbusters. Uh, I I watched Afterlife twice this week. <laughs> um, uh, there was uh, there were two new things that I watched. Uh, I watched Frozen Empire, which if you guys haven't already said so, yep, go already, check that out. We we did a review. Yep. yep. Yeah, a, just go see our thoughts about review. that. Um. But I also watched uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood for the first time. Nice. Ooh. Yes. Yeah, I liked it a lot. Um, I <laughs> gave it a nine out of ten. What I shared on the Twitter page. What? You didn't see that? I shared a screenshot from it. I shared a screen- screenshot from it. Effing hippie mother effers. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the, <clears throat> one of um, one of Tarantino's best endings ever. Like, it, it's seriously. one of my favorite things that I've ever seen from him. Um, I mean, the part with the flamethrower. When he come, when the when that when that girl's in the pool. Yeah, 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 yeah. Everyone in the audience when I saw that was cheered and stood up. Like it was oh, fucking good. It was. This girl awesome. was on fire. It was twice. Awesome. Yeah, the uh, fucking twice. That was my immediate thought. I was like, she fucking died um, for being burned alive twice. And did you, okay, did you recognize Austin Butler in the movie? Yeah. Okay, just. No, uh, I, I knew it was him. <laughs> I because you know, I um, until Elvis came out, I didn't really pay attention to him and uh yeah. well, well that austin power okay <laughs> yeah he's one of the uh the cult members yeah okay so um that that was one thing i uh when I was, what the fuck is that fly fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> um that, uh one, one that of the things that i didn't really shut, the shut fuck up, up. <laughs> um really? the, the entire movie uh i was wondering what margot robbie's character's connection to everything was because i didn't know about these murders you, so you didn't know who she i had was. no fucking what? idea no, okay, so I knew that there were things that happened w- w- with Manson, and I knew about those murders and everything, but I didn't know, like, the specifics at all. Oh, okay. So, but like, I, I knew say- that shit happened, I just didn't but, know that this oh. was a telling of it. Okay, but you I'll- know who Sharon Tate is, right? I, I, I didn't, uh, I, that wasn't a name that I fully recognized. Okay. okay. I thought you meant you didn't know about the Manson murder. So it's like, no, wait, no, no, what? No, 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 no. I knew about what the fuck happened with Manson. I just, <laughs> I just, I didn't know like any of the specifics really. I knew he was a cult member. I knew that he led people to killing. I knew that he I, was yeah. the one who kind of killed the hippie movement. I was um, going to say, I, did I knew you live under a freaking rock? No, 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 no. I knew that. 
No, I, I just, I didn't know that that's what story he was telling with this. Yeah. Um. So and if you honestly, yeah, if you're not f- too familiar with like the Sharon Tate murder or anything like that. Yeah. You, if you just watch the movie cold, you'd probably be like, why is Margot Robbie in this? Like, what's Yeah. Because she has no connection to like, the rest of the fucking yeah, story. But to, <laughs> to those, to someone like me who does know like about that, like mm-hmm. you're, it, it is kind of like that thing. You're like, you're just waiting for that pin to drop. And yeah. Then, and then, you know, Tarantino does his thing and it's, it's amazing. You know? Well, like the, the thing is like, they kept mentioning Charlie. I was like, yeah. where the fuck are we going to see this Charlie dude? Other than like the very er- first it, scene okay, that we see him in. It's that six, was it. <laughs> it's in the late sixties and you, it's in Hollywood or that area. And then you mentioned Charlie. I feel like they said Charlie. They never said Charles. I've always heard Charles <laughs> when they talk about Charles Manson. I've never gonna... heard them be like, Oh yeah, Charlie Manson. Like, was... no, <laughs> that's gonna... innocent to me. I was going to say, if you don't know much about the Manson murders, that's going to, no, I, I, I knew I, I just, I didn't make that connection. That's going to so... hurt your chances. If you don't know, I mean, well, well, I just, yeah, uh, I, I, I went, um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I went, uh, uh, I went into the trivia after I watched it on IMDb. I was reading through everything. I was like, oh, 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 it hasn't fully connected to me, but you, let me know later. Oh, God. Uh, tech, send me a text. I think I know what you're talking about. You do. Um, I'm, I'm not going to look at it right now because I don't want to react. Uh-oh. Drop your it's, phone. It's Drop your whatever. Phone. <laughs> which, uh, I'll pick it up later. Which we'll, we'll get the trivia later. <laughs> yeah, I, I you're, just... You're going to pick up the phone uh, later? Yeah. <laughs> I always do at some point. <laughs> um, John got it. Yeah, no. Well, I knew. <laughs> uh, no, uh, I, I just... I, I don't know. Like, I, I knew about it and I, I just did not make that fucking connection. Because like I said... The name Charlie instead of Charles is innocent in in my mind. Like it's okay. just like associated with that. So I didn't make that connection whatsoever. fucking ever. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Um, but like as I was reading through the trivia, I was learning more about it. I was like, oh, okay. So this is it, like the details that I was fucking missing. Uh, um, I I thought it was really cool. Uh, um, I like the amount of detail that Tarantino put in as always. Yep. Um, and it. it Made me like him more as a filmmaker because I, I enjoy his films. Um, I just I've never been super big on him as a director. I feel like this might be his best directing work. I I would say I so. disagree. I think um, I mean Pulp Fiction, of course, and Reservoir Dogs. Um, I haven't seen Pulp Fiction all the way through. Wow! I fell asleep <laughs> the one time I tried watching it. I haven't tried it ever again. I'll let you borrow my Blu-ray. Okay, uh, I, I'll I'm. I'm I, I guess I would say I have movie slots throughout the week. Uh, I'll make sure to put that on one of them. Yeah. <laughs> one film that I have watched from him was uh, Django Unchained. Django, Django is Unchained. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It's, a, it's a great movie. And the only big issue I have was not the language because it was slavery back in the 1870s. You know, that was the language of the times. I mean, yeah. but I think that is, I think, my my only like real criticism with it. Okay. Yes. That Words like that were used course i know yeah. that i'm mm. not dumb yeah but i think tarantino i mean this is i think he looks I for an excuse <laughs> he seems to like yeah. that word yeah, yeah. he likes to work i mean even in pulp fiction yeah know? yeah he wrote that line for himself <laughs> which i yeah. mean i'm not saying yeah Tarant- i don't think tarantino is racist no no i don't no. think that at all yeah i just think he there's a there's a little bit of overboard with the amount of times he uses that word. Yes. Especially in Django. It's just the only thing that, got, that that bugged me a bit is that the violence, it was very over the top. Like, I it's, it's good. Called, that's it's Tarantino. That is Tarantino's that, job. That, yeah, that's his style. Did you watch the ending of Inglorious Bastards with them blowing up Hitler? No, I haven't seen that movie either. Oh, so. God, I it's need been to re-watch so long that. since I've seen Glorious, it. Oh, that needs to be a re- uh, review Glorious rewatch. Yes. Please. Oh, my God. Although, I can definitely say... The biggest positive for that film is Leonardo DiCaprio's villain performance. Oh, it is Calvin great. Candy. Yeah. yeah. And oh. apparently his the scene where he slammed yep. the cup was accidental. Yeah. It was accidental. And, and I thought, going. wow. And he kept that scene going. I was thinking, see, that is the master of Leonardo DiCaprio right there. <laughs> and Jake, uh, there's a scene similar to that or something similar to that happened with Jake Gyllenhaal in Nightcrawler. There's that scene in Nightcrawler where he's losing his mind in front of the mirror and he... Um, he goes ham on it, and uh, he shuts the the medicine cabinet, and it the mirror just shatters, and uh, Jill Nall actually got cut, um, but Ooh. he kept going with it. Sounds um, good. So, yeah. 
Uh, sorry, I was about to be that guy. I, I won't. <laughs> uh, is there anything that you watched? <laughs> Uh, no, that was everything. I, I, uh, that was everything I watched. I, I was gonna say, did you guys know that Viggo Mortensen kicked a helmet <laughs> in fellowship and then he broke his toe? I didn't actually hear about that until like a few years ago. Well, it's just, oh, it's one of those okay. things where like you you watch it, you watch it with a Lord of the Rings fan, <laughs> and you know they're a fucking fan if they mention it. <laughs> For some reason, I like when characters go absolutely insane. I, that's my type of character. Type. And the part where he just sits sits down immediately after. Like, Ooh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah like, <laughs> I mean, probably my one of my all time favorite, you know, actor injury moments in any film is Tom Cruise with uh, Mission Impossible Fallout, where he jumps from building to building. And oh my gosh, yeah, <laughs> so crazy. I mean, if you've seen that, you know, and uh, yeah, yeah, and he just the amount of uh, just <clears throat> effort he put into that and just dedication, just amazing. Yeah, no, hundred so percent. Um, but yeah, uh, John. Uh, what do you got, John? Want to do yours? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, movies I've seen this week, and also uh, to get to another thing. Uh, a couple is the the Ghostbusters movies. That's the only thing I watched. Afterlife, absolutely love. Uh, Frozen Empire, really enjoyed it. Um, I will do more Ghostbusters rewatch after seeing those two films. So you will see a Good. rating uh, of it. So definitely in the future. And one more thing, uh, mm. viewers and listeners, I have a surprise for you all. Though we attempted last week and failed. Yeah. <laughs> and because of technical difficulty. Damn production! <laughs> Curse you! <laughs> it was our okay. fault. <laughs> yep. Okay, so so last week, um, I bought uh, two movies on Blu-ray. I bought the first Dune on Blu-ray, which it did have the digital in there, but I couldn't use that digital because it was expired, which I don't understand because most of the other digital I had that were expired can be useful. So water burst, that's They've stupid. been really cracking down on that, making sure they actually do expire when they expire. No. Oh, God. <laughs> that's WB. That's so stupid. Okay. That's crazy. But Nobody that's... else expires. It's just WB. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, but I want it on digital, so I got a, I got a $10 iTunes gift card so I can actually buy it on digital. Oh, nice. so, uh, so I was able to get that on digital. And another movie that actually bought, which it actually is including the biggest surprise for all you fans out there, so get ready to be excited. We have a digital movie uh, copy to give away. Oh, heck yeah. Yeah. Somebody start ringing a bell. uh, Yes. (laughs) It's the... (laughs) <laughs> it's the digital copy of Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Woo! Yes. Let's go. Which is perfect for this week because the Miles Morales short film is coming out this week. Oh, oh yeah. I forgot about right. that. Yeah. There's, there's, there's a sp- short film in the Spider- Spider-Verse universe, a Miles Morales short film. It will be on YouTube on the 27th. It is a horror film about him like lo- losing his mind about having the spider powers. Like and when he first gets the powers, I think. Who made this? It's the Spider-Verse people. Yeah, no, it's, it's like it's legit like part a, of the universe. Official yeah. thing, yeah. I'm looking huh. forward. I'm looking forward to watching that. Yeah, it's, I, I just it's all about him having randomly. anxiety. Okay, you you told me last night after we got uh, Ghostbusters, uh, you told me about there's apparently an a animated show coming and yeah, all, the, on all this other shit with Ghostbusters. Like, yeah, I either like I'm in the wrong part of the internet or I'm just. <laughs> I'm just completely I forgot it was a real loop. thing too. No, I, I feel you. No, I, I yeah, felt the same way. Yeah. yeah, it comes out the 27th. It's a short film. Apparently, it's him having a freak out on the spider sense. Yeah, he has and an anxiety like, attack the entire time. Yeah, like a psychotic episode. Yeah. 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 So, so just to let you know, guys, uh, why I'm doing a digital giveaway. Uh, I love the film so much that I do have the digital, but I don't have the Blu ray and DVD. So, I bought the Blu ray and DVD that includes the digital copy, but I already have the digital. So. This digital copy that I have here is yours to own for all you Cinema Simon podcast fans not, out there. If you have not seen this movie yet, um, yes, you're doing you, yourself a huge disservice. So uh, I believe you said two weeks. Uh, uh I actually, now, but now we're gonna do this a uh, week. So, you, uh, so you now guys have a week. So here's how it's going to work. You need to hashtag Miles Morales. I repeat, hashtag Miles Morales. You can type it on Facebook. On Twitter, on Instagram, or any other site. Under and, under our official post. Yep, on, under our official post. For and, the giveaway. Yep, and we will do a giveaway of who will win this digital uh, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Man. So I know a lot of you guys want it. I only have one, and that <laughs> is it. So for all you excited fans out there, we will do a drawing uh, during the podcast next week. Yeah, the, so The giveaway post will be the official episode post when we post the YouTube link. And... Um, 
If you share it, you get a bonus entry like we did with Hoppenheimer. Yep, that's what we're going to do. Yeah. And so you can type in the comment section, Miles Morales, and we will do a giveaway of who will get the digital. So good luck to all you Spider-Man fans out there. Woo! Woo! Well, speaking of superhero, I think it's time for trivia. Yes, it's time for trivia. Um, Ice kind of screwed up yesterday. Paul did, wasn't sure if he was coming, so he did his over the phone. Except he wasn't finished formulating his answer, so okay. I cut him off. Dick. <laughs> <laughs> so he he gets one of the four points as a pity point. Okay, I, okay. Uh, this is where because you screwed me over. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> asshole. I'm probably not gonna get this. I didn't study. I've been so fucking well, busy. Well, we shall see. I've seen plenty of 2000 uh, superhero films, so we'll see. Well, this should be fairly easy. I purposely did not do the MCU because you mentioned the MCU. Yeah, no, I, I well, yeah. <laughs> MCU wasn't a thing yet. In the- uh, it, it was 2008. 2008 yeah. Well, there's only like two movies in that uh, three. three period. Well, no, two. Yeah, Uncredible just Iron Man and Incredible Hulk. Hulk. The other ones were 2010. I, I don't even. Uh, Iron Man, the Incredible Hog, and the Dark Knight. Those were the three superheroes. Iron Man 2. 2000 to me. Iron Man 2 is 2010. Oh, I always get 2009 and 2010 mixed up with that, with that one. I just. I think Thor. <laughs> that's all, that's all this I mo- think. In this trivia, you will get the, ti- the title of the movie already. Okay. okay. In Watchmen, which actor or actress already knew the source material and actively campaigned for a role in the movie? Ah. Uh. uh, uh. It's one of three people Malin, for me. Malin Ackerman would be, I guess. Uh, ah, fuck, it's one of three people. <sighs> Carla Gugino. My guess would be Billy Crudup. He, he's who my guess would be. I would say um, oh, Jack Earl Haley. He was one of the other ones I was guessing. <laughs> I'll wait till everybody gets the final answer. Oh, God. Now I have to figure out which one of you two answers. Oh, crap. John, do you want me to give you a suggestion? Please, Beca- because please, please do. Because those are two of the three. Uh, my third one was Jeffrey Dean Morgan. Mm-hmm. He's my okay, third guest. You know what? Yeah. To be fair, I'll do that, too. I'll, I'll, I'll say Jeffrey Dean Morgan just to be fair to see who I'm I going Jack right. Earl. There's a chance that all three of us get it wrong, but <laughs> I feel like we're covering our bases a bit. What was your stone? Billy Crudup. Uh, I said Jeffrey D. Jack Hero. Rorschach's Journal. I was okay. right. Hey, nice. He, he was the other one I was a taking really seriously. Died in New York. So he got three points, right? Four. Four. Nice. So Garrett just caught up, I think, with first place now. Hell yeah. Nice. <laughs> All right. Look at that. I'm, I'm a very cool second. John, you need to go Woo. back through the last few episodes and confirm points. Okay. That was your job. You're supposed to go back to the last few trivia's. Yeah, John. <laughs> I didn't know. I'm sorry. Yeah, I told you last week. You're um, good, you're good. we're gonna get a. We're gonna start like a. Just put it in the. We'll get like a Google Doc or something going, and we'll keep track of the points that way. Just do the notes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, you're here for every episode. Okay. Because I he, get... he should just relay it to you. Okay. That's what I'm saying. He should give me the information. Okay. We'll, I'll get a piece of paper and write it down. Yeah. We'll do like a tally marker. I did get the yeah. '70s comedy one right last week. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Go back through season two and write down. Or tell me that all the. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll definitely try. I'll try to definitely do that. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Now our main discussion point. Yeah. Best cinematography. Okay. Okay. This ought to be good. There's. There are lots of good movies that has great cinematography. You guys know this is coming. I'm just throwing it out there. Interstellar. Yep. Yeah. Um, no, we know. <laughs> yeah. No surprise there. <laughs> no additional comments either. <laughs> Nothing compares. Well, I say Oppenheimer comes a Barry John Quill's second. It's there's the same second. cinematographer. That's why. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. That's why. I mean, yeah, but there's, but that cinematography in that movie was was just so incredible. Uh, mm. The explosions, the way it was shot. It like, was quite the bomb. <sighs> Are there any puns that I have to catch up on? Uh, just the one from earlier. There was only two so far this episode. Okay. Wow, lovely. I might have to go last. <laughs> All right, Matthew, you're at 355 now. God fucking damn it. But yeah, um, Oppenheimer is, is um, yeah, it's got some fantastic uh, cinematography on that one. Uh, what's it go next? This one. We could just keep going around the table until when we come up with stuff. I would say, um, I mean, it's fairly new, but um, what Greg Frazier has been doing with cinematography for um, not just Dune recently, but Batman and Rogue, Rogue One, One um, just his technique of um, putting 
because Dune, I believe, and Batman were both sh- originally shot on digital, but he did a thing where he exposed it on the film, and then you know, that's how he, uh, the Batman and Dune, that's how they both look how they look. Um, they just they have a look that just feels so distinct from most big blockbusters because they don't they don't quite look digital, but they don't quite look like film either. They have that real. They have a really distinct, like, balance. It's kind of like a neo-retro. That makes it feel timeless, in my opinion. Um, <clears throat> and I love... There's digital cinematography, I think. Um, I'm not just a champion. I, I am a champion of shooting on film still, like Hoyatama and Chris Nolan do, like, on Oppenheimer. I still am a champion of that, shooting on film, when it's available, but most of the time it isn't. Um, and yeah, most films now are shot on digital and I shoot on digital as well. But there are some gorgeous films that are shot digitally that really, that look incredible. And one my my choice um, is going to be uh, The Revenant, um, okay. which was shot by seen that. Emmanuel nice. Lebeski. Uh, and the, this, of course, uh, was uh, the film that was directed by Alejandro G. Inuritu, if I'm mispronouncing that name, um, I am sorry. But yeah, uh, same guy did Birdman and um, a few other things. Um, Oscar winning director. But yeah, uh, The Revenant was shot on digital. And it, of course, is the story of Hugh Glass. And it takes place in the, um, the pr- uh, I forget exactly what time period, but I think it's in the 1700s. And probably um most people if you most cinematographers if they had the choice to would shoot that on film because it is a period piece and you probably would want to give it that vintage look for that time period but um lebeski purposefully wanted to shoot it on digital because they wanted you to feel like you were in that environment um while film Film, I think, has a, a way to make films look timeless and to make things look grand. I'd say digital has a great, I th- digital shoot di- cinematography. I, I think is great for making you feel like more Im- immersed into whatever environment uh, the film takes place in. Um, uh, and the Revenant was shot because of that. Because when you're watching the Revenant, you feel the cold of the forest you feel like you are freezing along with Leonardo DiCaprio's character because, I mean, they were. Because I, I've i watched behind the scenes um, talk about how the movie was shot, and literally part of the budget, um, and I forget what exactly the budget ballooned up to. Um, originally, it was supposed to be less, but I think it bloomed upwards of about 150, I think more. I think it... Uh, Cost ended up costing more than 150 million. I'm looking it up right because, now because um, because of the harsh conditions that the film was shot in. I mean the the equip equipment like cameras and you know that kind of equipment is not built to be in conditions that cold, and it, it ended up the equipment half the time ended up breaking just because of how cold it was and. They had to keep buying more equipment, yeah. and <clears throat> just the way that the film really does draw you in to the environment using the cinematography. I was gonna say it's very fascinating that Leonardo DiCaprio pretends to survive in the cold. I mean, he, and try to sleep under dead animals. <laughs> I mean, he basically was. It uh, it was about as cold as the film depicts. No kidding. <laughs> um, I think it was shot in Alberta, Canada. Ooh. and it, it is <laughs> wow. it's brutal up there. I need, and to, I need to watch to see how I feel about it. It's just, oh. you feel as cold as the character does. The, and the, um, the film just has, what was the... The budget was $135 million and made 533 okay. I mean, it was a huge success. Um, yes. And, uh, I mean, um, talking more detail about the cinematography, um, uh, <clears throat> it a lot of the times they use wide-angle lenses, um to make you feel like you're up close with these characters. Um, a lot of the time, um, 
the depth of field of the, the image is very deep. There's not a lot of um, shallow depth of field like a lot of um, a lot of movies do. Um, <clears throat> you you literally it's it feels so immersive when you watch that film, um, and that's part of the reason why I think uh, it turned out to be as successful as it did. Yep. So uh, apparently, it was film the water phone ceiling waterfall scenes were filmed near Libby, Montana. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Montana was also a spot. Canada was actually too warm. Really? Yeah. They went to the, what, I guess, I'm assuming to mountains, Tierra del Fuego, Argentina. Mm. That's not a place you would expect to be no, cold Arge like No, Argentina, you'd think hot. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, their equipment a lot of times didn't work just because of the conditions. And yeah. the fact that they did manage to sh finish the film, um, you know, despite... <clears throat> Because that's you have to expect that when you're filming something like that, things will happen, and um, when you shoot on location, especially. Yeah. So, um, the fact that they managed to get the film finished and all that, and to have it be as successful as it did, yeah, that's my choice. Yeah, pretty much the quick answer I can pretty much give just to save time. Uh, any film directed by Denise Villeneuve, like that's a very simple yeah, answer. Yeah, Blade Runner twenty forty nine. Yeah, wait, Blade Runner 2049, the Dune movies. Prisoners. Prisoners. Yep. Arrival. Uh, I, 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 uh, Arrival, shot beautifully by Roger shot. Deakins. I still have not watched Enemy yet, and because I'm sort of afraid of spiders. I've not watched Enemy yet either. <laughs> the spider is not as big of a part as you think it would be. Okay. Um, that's mainly, it is in the film, it's just, it's mainly like a, a metaphor. Because I do want to watch every single of his movies so I can do my ranking, and I still need to watch the Blade Runners movies. I personally like... I like the story more, but I also like the cinematography more of Blade Runner 2049 than I do the first one. I do, one. too. I but mean, I, it's I visually love... stunning. Yeah. The film look of uh, the original Blade Runner is also beautiful. It is. Yeah. I just like 2049 more. I feel like That's overall it was... sad, yeah. I feel like overall it was just an all-around improvement on an already great film. Yeah. The first one's already a great film, but I just feel like it improved everything. Yeah. That's pretty much the most important key about films is you gotta have great cinematography. You gotta feel. Something. That is a big point, but I I don't think that's definitely the top thing, but it's definitely a major point. And yes. I also think, um, uh, going back to like Greg Frazier and uh, his films like The Batman, The Batman, um, I think it's also cinematography is not just about you know the camera you use or you know. The aspect ratio it's also about the lenses you use that's so important um the batman was mainly shot with you know um and you probably heard this before anamorphic lenses um which are mainly uh designed for having films in that wider aspect ratio and uh anamorphic lenses uh they um they take in light a lot differently than um like the lens I'm using right now to film this uh, is a, a round lens, while anamorphic lenses are uh, square shaped. So they they just have they look different. Um, I mean, if you look at them side by side, like on the surface, you'd probably be like they look s similar, but um, just the the way that light, um, especially in the Batman, just um, the way that the colors kind of like. Everything looks kind of faded, but it, it looks beautiful in the way that it does it. Um, it looks and, very grungy. Uh, and I love when films are shot uh, on anamorphic lenses. Another example of this is um, a film that I think needs more love and attention is The Empty Man from 2020. Um, <clears throat> and this, this was a horror film that came out of nowhere, and it came out during the pandemic. And it was originally a, a 20th Century Fox film. Uh, it was originally meant to be released earlier, but then Disney came in and didn't really have any idea what to do with the film, and uh, they just pretty much shoved it out there. And now, um, I mean, you'd have to run it now to you know watch it, but and it, it actually got a, a release on HBO Max, um, and that's how a lot of people got to see it. Um, afterwards but yeah that film is also so shot in a lot of anamorphic lenses and um i think that movie is gorgeous um it's a really haunting film it's a really unique film and um 
like the Batman, it's all sh- also shot on similar lenses. And um, yeah, just has a really unique look that you don't really see too often. Adding to my letterbox watch list. Uh, what, do you, awesome. uh, what do you got doing? Uh, actually, uh, talking a little about uh, about lens work. Um, uh, poor things. Yeah. Uh, that that was one of the things that really stuck out to me with that movie. That, yeah. that was how I knew I, mean, I was going to like it, the, was just the use of the various lenses that they did. I mean, it goes from, you know, fish really wide fisheye lenses in like a millisecond to, you know, going back to what would mostly be like, you know, uh, the I would consider like medium length uh, lenses, like the that focal length. This is very technical, but I work in cinematography, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I consider like the medium range of that would be like twenty millimeter to like seventy millimeter, yeah. um, and eighty. Like I have an eighty-five millimeter lens, I consider that what would be a as a really long focal length that you can like zo- you can really get um, close on to uh, that. Would, that's referred to as a telephoto lens, and. Um, I also have a uh, fisheye lens, as they call it, and that's a uh, twelve meter, millimeter. Yeah. And with poor things, um, I mean, some of those shots look like they were shot with like, I don't know, six millimeter. Like it's it's insane how, you know, <coughs> wide some of those shots are. But it, yeah, um, it is gorgeous though. Yeah. Well, th- that's a movie that I probably will never watch. Uh, you, you you shouldn't. You wouldn't like. <laughs> no. It. no. I, should. <laughs> I had to admit though, it is one of those movies where I'm thinking, how in the world did they do that? Well, like it's it, so impressive. It it is. Um, I I liked a lot of the in like it. The movies. Uh, the movie. The movie cine, uh, cinematography is great. Aside from the lens work, but the lens work yes. really makes it pop. Uh, I I like uh one of the early shots when uh her uh, when Emma Stone's character is in the carriage uh with yeah. uh, got with uh with God, <laughs> and she's yeah. like ice cream. And ice cream. they they uh do uh these like zooming shots uh inside to help yeah. like illustrate. Like, like how it is for her and be, because the entire movie's from her perspective. That's the reason yeah. why it's so fucking weird. Um, um yeah, it, it, it just, I, I, I thought that that really popped. That was one of the things that really stood out to me about it. Uh, uh and that, that's what, uh, that's also kind of what led me to changing my opinion about their went on the production design uh, award was because that also, it went really hand in hand, Wh- which good. I, every facet of movie production should go hand in hand. And I, I think it did there. Um, but just the cinematography made uh, a lot of the sets really work. And it, it I, I don't know, like I just, it, it blew me away, especially yep. with the, especially with like the fish islands. I was like, oh my God, you don't um, see this very often. Uh, I think you should talk about this one film, The Creator. Yeah. Oh. Mm-hmm. Uh- just like I, I a, would, uh, darn, I stole it. Yeah, you stole it from me. So. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, I think, this we, should one talk, is I think we should talk. I think we should talk about films that don't shoot on cameras. Like, what's co- what the most probably common like big studio like Hollywood camera now is the Ari Alexa. That's probably the most commonly used camera right now for big budget movies. But like, we should talk about films that are are shot on like more consumer level cameras. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think this is a yeah. good spot where we Yeah, the cinematography the was unbelievable. This was also shot by Greg Frazier. Um yeah. Frazier yeah. was. And uh not a lot of CGI, just bare bones. Yeah. The whole camera rig that they used. That this was had the feel of a 200 million dollar movie. It was made for 80 million. The filming rig, the enti- the entire rig was $4800. <laughs> Which yeah. is crazy. And they they shot on a camera that I used for my low paying uh my first full time job as a videographer uh the Sony FX3 which is I think costs just a little bit more than the camera that I'm using right now I think it costs a little bit more than the Black Magic six the six K um you know the Sony FX3 is by all means a consumer level camera um it's like twenty eight hundred I think yeah close to. Yeah. Um, I mean, far less than what than the rental cost for an Ari camera, or even a Red camera. Those yeah. are like twenty, thirty thousand. Yeah. Um. It's just yeah. What they did with the creator in, I mean, for what they shot it with, it, it's it's a miracle. Yeah, it's stunning. It's stunning, and 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 that's and that's kind of a cheap camera to use for a movie it like is. that. Compared Normally, to like yeah. other movies, yeah. 
Yeah, most yeah. week cameras can be so expensive to make cinematography like that, but only forty eight hundred dollars. That's crazy. The that was crea- for the entire the rig. Creator, yeah. An eighty million dollar movie looks more cinematic than a three hundred million dollar MCU Indiana, movie. Yeah. Indiana looked more cinematic than the three hundred dollar Indiana Jones movie did. Or, or even a three hundred three hundred million dollar Joss Whedon's Justice League, which yeah. didn't go quite as yeah. well as people were hoping. Well, that's a whole different beast of its own. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I have one. Not just the cinematography. After Snyder I left, one that's more like on the creator. And then, um, one more thing about the creator. Uh, I think we can agree. Showing the creator, uh, which was made by 20th Century Studios, still owned by Disney, but compared to mainstream Disney movies like the MCU, Indiana Jones. Yeah. I think Disney. It's embarrassing. Well, my. <laughs> They think the more money they throw at it, yeah. the faster the CGI and stuff will work. You can't yeah. rush the product by throwing more money at it. You have to take time and craft your product. Yeah. What were you saying, Paul? Oh, I was, I was going to say I have one. You know, since we're talking about, you know, lower budget rigs. Um, I knew you were going to bring this up. Not, not to toot our own horn. But the fact that the first harvest looks better with a roughly thirteen thousand dollar budget <laughs> than Winnie the Pooh Blood and Honey. Yeah. <laughs> Which mm-hmm. <laughs> um and yeah, it's, it's amazing. And yeah, first harvest was shot on this thing. Um and I think that's a that, good point. That is the phone. And that is um I mean it's a a lot of movies have been shot on like smartphones. The phone, um, boss. The phone. And um, <laughs> I think um, I think this is a good chance to talk about some movies that were just shot on iPhone. Um, There's uh, even someone, some Netflix originals that have been yes, shot on um, iPhone. A film yeah. that uh, one of the directors that uses iPhones a lot for making movies is uh, Steven Soderbergh, who is most known for probably the Ocean's Eleven movies and Magic um, Mike. Yeah, Magic Mike. <laughs> Um, John's favorite movie. No, it's not. <laughs> he's a very experimental filmmaker, and as far as I know, he's shot two movies, um, maybe more, um, but two movies that I've seen at least that were uh, shot on an iPhone. Um, one of these was a movie I saw in theaters a few years ago that was Unsane, um, a movie starring Claire Foy. Um, it's a, a thriller, a uh, soccer thriller. Um, and it was shot on, I forget which iPhone model it was shot on, but it was shot on a, a movie came out in 2018, so it was like iPhone like 6 or something like that, maybe older. Um, a really interestingly shot movie. Um, you can tell it's not shot on a high-budget camera, but it really does have a distinct look, and it does make you feel like you're in a claustrophobic environment because it is shot on uh, a, you know, a pretty... Uh, short focal lens, so it's a very wide angle uh, that you're getting most of the time, and it does put you in some uncomfortable shots. So, uh, I I actually read about this movie, and um, I was reading about uh, I get articles come up since I like longer movies about long movies, mm-hmm. and um, this is a David Lynch movie. It's a psychological thriller that came out in 2006. Uh, it's a three-hour movie. It's called Inland Empire. Yeah. That movie was shot on some interesting stuff. I, I haven't seen the movie. I've, I've wanted to check I it out. I want to do it as a review rewind. Yeah. It was done on a camcorder. Yeah. A Sony camcorder. <laughs> oh, nice. Oh, okay. Like a, a really, like a pretty cheap one. Yeah, 2500 $2, I believe it said. Yeah. It, the budget was th- like $3 million. Isn't it like a three-hour movie? <laughs> yeah, it's three hours. But uh, it has Laura Dern, Jeremy Irons, yep. oh. Harry Dean Stanton. Like, it's got a solid cast. Wow. Yep. Okay. okay. So I, I definitely want to do that for a review rewind, just for the technical aspect of it. For another, it. Um, another interesting, uh, another movie that was shot on iPhone, um, you might have heard of it if you're an indie film lover, is uh, Tangerine. Um, this was directed by Sean Baker um, in 2015. It was when the film came out. That was shot on an iPhone 5S, and it was shot on an anamorphic lens adapt, well, anamorphic lens for an iPhone. So, you know, they got that kind of look like Batman did, but just on a on a more, you know, iPhone level. And the film, <clears throat> like uh, like Unsane, r- has a really unique look because of it, because it takes place in the streets of Los Angeles, and it follows these, uh, this group of um, 
It's a group of. <laughs> Hold on. I haven't seen the movie in a bit, um, but uh, I remember really enjoying it. And it's just it follows these this group of really strange uh, people, um, and it's just it has that kind of unique look to it that makes it stand out from other films that might have you know other Hollywood eyes films. And uh, I really recommend checking that film out, especially if you're into cinematography. Um, and hey, Paul, do you have a uh, favorite cinematography that you liked? Ooh, for me, it it's really hard to. And don't you dare pick. say me. <laughs> <laughs> as far as far as indie films go, yes, I will say you. As far as indie films go, and I promise you, I'm not just saying that because I work with you. Like literally every other Saturday, it seems. <laughs> I'm not just saying that. Because I watch a lot of indie films. I love a lot of indie films dearly. Yep. Your work is, in my opinion, the best that I've seen of indie films. Thank you. Garrett, I genuinely oh, mean that. That makes some great work. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, that is the God's honest truth. As far as, uh, as, far as like, bigger studio, um, bigger studio movies, um, I, I don't know a lot of names, so I'm just going to say movies. Um, Same. I feel like I feel like Oppenheimer is by far the best I've seen. Hoytema, Van Hoytema. Who also did Interstellar. We're gonna ignore that though, because I hate that movie. I, <laughs> that is another movie I watched. I actually watched part. I, I watched part of it earlier today on you, your on your video. Oh, you did. Yeah, I made it about thirty minutes in. <laughs> so you haven't even gotten to the space part yet. No, that's the thing. It's a space movie. I want. I want to be in space. Well, you need, well, you need that. Need you that gotta build a whole set up on Earth. I will say that it is. It is more interesting than what I remembered. And once you get to the space stuff, especially, just it gets drastically better once they're in outer space. Well, just the visuals. I, I yeah. Like, no. No. I, I, I like yeah. all the stuff on Earth. I, no, it, it's good. It's, it's one of my favorite movies, but the visuals alone should make anyone at least want to watch it all the way through once. Yeah, yeah, agreed. One day it'll happen. I, I, I understand. <laughs> I understand why people don't like the ending, especially. So. Right. I mean, I do want to. I do want to rewatch it because I because I wanted to love it. I really do. Here's a space movie for you, Paul, that you do enjoy, The Martian. Yeah, the that Martian. is great cinematography. Absolutely, I thought, I thought so. Um, I forget where they shot that though. Um, Unfortunately, not Mars. That <laughs> yeah, would be cool. Gonna, I was about to say Mars. Duh. <laughs> Elon, Elon wasn't that rich yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I got. I got. A I, co- oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Is the middle of my list interrupting the beginning of yours? <laughs> God, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> I was also going to say the Revenant. Yeah, um, Revenant it, looks awesome. It, it it's just so good. And also, Matthew, I started my top hundred movies of all time list. It's, it's in the top seventy five. Oh, The Martian. Least. Uh, Revenant. Oh, okay. The Martian is in top hundred for sure. Yes. <laughs> it, okay. I didn't um, mean to interrupt you. My my bad. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Um. Oh gosh, it's totally slipping my mind. Bear with me. I have the headache from hell, y'all. Mind um, keeps on slipping, slipping, slipping. <laughs> see, the, the, this memory issue I'm having right now is something that I normally would expect from John or Matthew because they're old fucks. But Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> um, that wasn't the joke I was expecting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my no, goodness um, gracious. Uh, Interstellar, or shit, Oppenheimer. <laughs> yes! yes! <laughs> Oppenheimer. Uh, Oppenheimer is my favorite. Revenant, uh, Martian. And then I, I think that those would be my biggest ones, really. And also, um, I'll, I'll wait till you. Uh, 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 okay, okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, uh, I got, I, I got, a, got a couple. Um, I gotta talk one more Christopher Nolan film. Uh, Inception got incredible. That's what I was yeah, say. Got, yep. got incredible cinematography. And I gotta get the last one, which I haven't watched yet. But however, I want to do. I do want to bring this up because. I cannot believe how incredible the cinematography is. And that is 2000 The Space Odyssey. Yeah, 2001. Yeah. Here's my biggest question. How is this a 1968 movie? It, it looks better than a lot of, like, 2000 yeah. movies. Yeah, I mean, it I, looks... I refuse to believe this film came out in 1960. It looks it looked like a movie that could be made today. And it looks unbelievable. I um, I got, I was fortunate enough to get the chance to see 
2001 because a few years ago they released it in IMAX. Oh, 2001. I think I saw it in the State Museum Theater. It just, oh, wow. And they had the intermission and everything. Like, probably top five greatest theatrical experience I've ever had. Like, the sequence with at the end where he goes through the, what I call the, star, it's called usually called the Stargate. Yeah. Um, that trippy sequence. Um, I've, I don't think I've ever felt more immersed into a movie or, or, I mean, it's literally meant to hypnotize you. I've only seen it once, so. It's, seeing it on the theater makes a huge difference compared to watching it at home. Yeah. Because your first thought when watching 2001 at home is, I'm going to fall asleep. <laughs> but, um, no, watching in the theater, it, it really does feel like, it really does boost the experience there's not much watching. dialogue in that movie and right? that's the stanley kubrick thing uh, of course but like it's just looks 1968 it just looks amazing at least with watching it at home uh, watching it on a projector is better than a tv yeah that's a little bit better i still it refuse still to look stunning to i still day. refuse to believe it came out in 1968 yeah. that that is crazy i mean you can refuse to believe it but that's the facts <laughs> i refuse and i it, refuse to believe that you're under 90 john <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. i've got a couple more about garrett set, what, what you this got it's not about the cinematography but the sound in 2001 is just so crystal clear for the time. Yes. Yeah. You're not, and I'm not usually used to that when watching a movie from yeah. like the 60s. But the I sound definitely, is just I so definitely good. want to watch it, but I'm so worried that this movie could say, I love the visuals, but the movie may not work for me because there's not much dialogue in this movie, right? Yeah. There's whole segments where it's like 30 minutes of that dialogue. Yeah. It's just dead silence. So. I hope the movie doesn't ruin it for me because I, I, I do want to watch it. It's a very therapeutic movie, I'd say. Yeah. Okay. I get this sort of like a Fantasia thing, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> I love I love Fantasia. Right, See, it's the I opposite of Fantasia. It sounds like. <laughs> I guess so, but uh, yeah. I've got a couple more. Um, I don't like these two as much, but I feel like the cinematography in the Last Jedi and Rise of Skywalker is really good. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll definitely Last agree Jedi. about Last Jedi. Yeah, yeah. Rise you of Skywalker, I think yeah. so. Um, for me, it was, a lot of the time it was just really dark and kind of ugly. Um. Last Jedi, especially in like the throne room. Yes, yeah, and that's what I was thinking and specifically. The 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 last like the climax on the the red like the red salt planet. Yes, that uh, looked great. That looked yeah. insane. I love the scene where I love the scene where the one of the Star Wars characters was walking. It was literally like fire was surrounding that character. Yeah, that is an awesome shot. Last, whatever you think about Last Jedi, it's a gorgeous movie. It is yeah. absolutely yeah. gorgeous. Going back to more Hoyt, uh, Hoytma. Is that how you say it? Yeah. Ad Astra. Yeah, Ad Astra looks great. Oh my too. gosh, yeah. Um, yeah, especially like any of the stuff. Um, they go to Mars in that one, right? I believe. Uh, yeah, they go to Mars. Yeah, any of that stuff um, looks amazing, especially yeah. the moon sequence. Yeah. Um, oh, not, not the, just on a special effects level. The like, Land Rover scene? Yeah. Yeah, so it was so amazing. sick. Um, one of the coolest yeah, scenes. Whether, that whether you love it or not, uh, I love that sequence where they were driving on the moon. That was a great shot. Yeah, that's shot. what we're talking about. Yeah, that's like the highlight of the movie. Yeah, that's yep. great cinematography there. Um, I got two more, but I'll save them in case anybody else has anything else. Um, I, I feel bad because none of us have brought up the master of Steven Spielberg and his, uh, his oh, most... Oh, yeah. His, uh, the cinematographer he's worst mo most with, and that is... Um, What's his name? Um, hold on a second. <laughs> and uh, yeah, but Steven Spielberg's like main cinematographer he works with now. Um, I love. I personally love that look he usually applies to his movies. Um, and his name is uh, Janusz Kaminski. Um, he has worked with Spielberg ever since uh, the. Uh, Schindler's List, and oh, that right. was their first movie together. And um, I, I personally, a lot of people may not get into like the real grainy, kind of bleached look of some of uh, his movies. Um, I personally love it. Um, Minor Minority Report is one of my all time favorite Spielberg movies. I need such to a watch good movie. That. Um, I need to watch that. One of his most underrated. And I loved how it almost looks like certain parts look black and white. They look very grainy and very bleached uh but i personally love it 
Um, that's just a aesthetic thing for me. But now Spielberg uh, and Kaminsky really do interesting things with the lighting, like the way shadows are cast on people's faces, the way faces are sometimes very overly you know exposed and bright it it does have that real fantastical look to it a lot of the time for me and um of course something like uh saving private ryan which i think was what really did modernize the war film that we really the style we know as today for war films uh in the way that that film was shot with a very <clears throat> with a very um low shutter speed because everything looks super jittery, especially in the um, the D Day sequence in the beginning, everything just feels super quick, and everything just has this really energetic look. Yeah, like you're you know really witnessing something horrifying, um, and um, yeah, I love I love the look of Saving Private Ryan and a lot of those Spielberg movies. So. I would say the Jurassic Park had some phenomenal yeah. cinematography. Like the dinosaurs look so and real in that. That movie. cinematographer is Dean Cundey, um, who has shot some of your favorite movies ever. Like this dude has shot Jurassic Park. Um, he shot Back to the Future. Yes. Oh, oh yes. John Carpenter's The Thing. Halloween. I mean, Dean Cundey is often regarded as one of the great cinematographers. Just, I mean, look at his filmography. Yeah. I mean. I mean, having Back to the Future, Jurassic Park, Halloween, and, you know, a lot of those other John Carpenter movies. They're still trying to get and, me to watch the thing. And Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Um, that's oh, I, did he really? I, I didn't know that, that he did yeah, that. All right. an insane filmography. That's one of the best movies of all time. And it didn't even just get, the, the, it didn't even color, get Best Picture nomination. It's so color, dumb. It's so good. Just the way, just how bright and colorful movies like that back then looked. Um, yeah. Just has the real nostalgic look, nostalgic look for me. Oh yeah. Yes, John, you need to watch the thing. Yeah. Yeah. And Blood and Honey. You're no, not getting out of no. it. No, I told you the deal was off. He, are, he made a he made a ramp video before he got here. And, uh, <laughs> it's still the deal is not off. No, it is off. Nope. <laughs> yes, Paul. I said the answer is no. <laughs> Two out of three majority rules. No. Yeah. <laughs> no. We're don't not ask getting, me. Don't ask me again. This. It's never gonna happen. That's not Good. the main topic. <laughs> yeah, it's not the main topic. Goodbye. <laughs> uh, do you guys have any other ones these could pick up? Not really. Yeah. I I just have like news and whatnot. Uh, okay, I'll uh, I'll you can Dil get into Dylan. Do you have any more? And then I'll finish mine off, and then you can do yeah, yours. Yeah, I have, I have a few. <laughs> okay. Um, we we kind of touched on it earlier, but I feel like one movie we really glanced over, uh, which has one of the, uh, in my opinion, the second best shot in the entire franchise, is No Way Home. Because we can talk about how the MCU doesn't have great cinematography throughout, or at least not like cinematography you can actively talk about and actively praise. But No Way Home was fucking amazing when you're standing in front of the J.K. Simmons yes. uh, billboard. Like yes. yes, that's one that, in my opinion, that's the second best shot in the entire MCU. No Way Home, I think, I think, yeah, shots like that do look great. I think it unfortunately falls victim to the COVID times where. A, a lot of No Way Home just looks really fake. <laughs> I mean, the, most of that I think is it looks great. visual effects. Yeah, I agree. Like, a lot of the green screen doesn't look great. Um, the only really? bit of oh, green screen like, that I cannot shots, stand next like, to um, is Flash. The part, That's yeah, it. The Flash Thompson, the part where in the beginning where Flash Thompson's looking at a phone and the street is, like, completely yes. empty. And it That's looks, the only one that I can't looks, defend. It just looks cheap. Yeah, I, I can't defend uh, that one. Yeah. Shang-Chi does look good, though. No, yeah, yeah no, Shang-Chi looks, looks amazing. Uh, um, uh, I, I guess I'll just uh, go go through mine that that way I can get them out. Um, a, another one that I wanted to throw out there was uh, uh, uh basically like any of Edgar Wright's movies. Yo, oh my god. Um, uh, he for, first of all, Edgar Wright himself uh, uh loves playing uh, playing tricks with the camera. He loves yeah. the Texas Switch. That's one of the, the big uh, uh camera things that he he will gush about. He, he made, like, an entire uh, Twitter thread of, like, 34 tweets or something like that <laughs> just talking about that. Um, what's, it, it, what's it called? The Texas Switch? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's the Texas Switch. Switch. I, I think that's what it is. That's a term I'm not familiar with. Yeah, um, uh, the uh, the number one example that I would use in his films for it would be in Scott Pilgrim when Cho, uh, when Cho shows up and... Er, God. When Knives shows yeah. up 
And uh, she's like, hey, is Scott here? And you see Scott take off to the other side yeah, of the room the and then just immediately go back through and jump through the window. And he's like, yeah, he actually just uh, went out. <laughs> 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 um, and that's not just because he's he's my favorite uh, director, but I just feel like uh, him and the cinematographer work really hand in hand together, which, which is, in my opinion, how it should be. Um, I need to rewatch Scott Pilgrim. I've only seen it once. It's awesome. It's one of my favorite fucking movies of all time. It's my. It's uh, one of my four on Letterboxd. Um, uh, I also uh, really love Baby Driver. The cinematography yes. in Baby Driver was really good, in my opinion. I need to watch that too. Um, I, I fucking it's, love it. Uh, Baby Driver was actually shot by Bill Pope, who yeah is a uh, famous for The Matrix and Star yeah yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. Bill Pope is also great. Mm. Um, I like it. There was, there was like one other that I really wanted to mention. Yeah, my two are, other ones are older. Oh, um, uh, um, um, Moro, uh, Moro Fiore. Uh, I hope that I pronounce his name right. Mor- Mor- Moro Fiore. Y- yeah. Uh, he also did Avatar. Yep. But I won't say some of the other movies that he did because I don't think. Nope. I don't either. think we need to get into that right <laughs> yeah. now. Um, yeah. So don't bring it up. Bring him up. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm surprised that we haven't talked about. Uh, we we kind of. Brush, uh, brush on with Paul and I came on earlier, but Tarantino's films. Yep. Like, those are also shot really fucking well. I, I don't know if he has one principal cinematographer that he works with or if he's used a variety throughout. No. Um, but I, I feel like it's, it's just Tarantino style. Himself. Yeah. Yeah. Not the cinematography style, it's just his style. Yeah. I, I, don't, I just, there was something about how Once Upon a Time in Hollywood was shot. I, I can't really put my finger on it. Because I really do think that that's the best shot film out of all the ones that I've seen. Yeah. Uh, again, I haven't seen Pulp Fiction all the way through, but like uh, Reservoir Dogs, Hateful Eight, Jingo Unchained. I've not watched Hateful um, Eight yet. I l- fun. Yeah, I really it's like fun. it. Um, I can understand some of the criticisms uh, criticisms about it. <laughs> I've got the Blu-ray. I just haven't watched it yet. I I recommend it. I I think it's a great watch. Cast, I really need to rewatch is it. Just irresistible. In that yeah. Part. So yeah, it's stacked. The Blu-ray was four dollars and eighty cents on Amazon a couple like last year, so it's like, oh yeah, my God, that's I bought it. Steal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it, that that would probably be the other mention for me is almost like any of Tarantino's films. I think they're all shot really well. I think it's because he also coordinates really yeah. well. Yep. Uh, Derek, do you have any more Garrett, or was that it? Okay. Um. No. Okay. Uh, Derek Van Lint. As a cinematographer for this movie, um, one of the greatest sci-fi horror movies of all time. You guys know where I'm going with this. Yeah. Um, just like the low, like low tech look, like what's just, which Alien, Alien, yeah, like yeah, the moody yeah. hallways and just, yeah. just how how it looks really low budget, even though it's not. Like, yeah, it just seems like really like indie style, just low tech, like yeah. Just it's a whole look of its own, the, like the um, um yeah the sh- the way that uh, shadows are you know placed you know lighting through um, structures you know in the Nostromo yeah. a lot of those tunnel or corridors yeah. you know lighting through the vents and stuff giving it <clears throat> a the really you know eerie element yeah well part of it's the production design too with yeah. that but you can't even yeah yeah it, is, it goes hand in hand. Yeah. And that, now we're going back a really far in time. Metropolis. Yeah. It's oh, yeah. yeah. For the time, it was incredible. It was what, what year did it come out again? 1927. Wow. It still even holds up today in some ways. That's what I heard. Like, the production is incredible on that in the cinematography. Um, I think I, I have one more to get to, and then I think... Paul's we, got his thing, yeah. Yeah. Um, on, you know, in that era... You, you also have to bring up the German expressionism and how they use shadows, especially on films like uh, Nosferatu. Yes. Um, the way that shadows are casted on walls, like, it's it's in a whole other, like, plane, like, a whole other world. Um, and it's, the look of, like, that, uh, the look of German expressionism has exp- inspired me to make, is going to inspire me to make, um, a certain idea I have for my own film using that kind of style um, that a lot of silent films use. Nice. So. I cannot wait to uh, for to do that thing Paul and I were telling you about. Mm-hmm. That's going to be really fun. Yeah. 
but yeah, I, I think I, I'm done. Yeah, I think yeah. that's it. Yeah, that, that's it for me. Uh, yeah. Uh, did you say you had some uh, news to talk about? I have news, and then if I can do a quick review of the convention I was at. Uh, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, cool. All right, so I do have a bit of filming news for Alan and Mickack Films. This Saturday, we are filming Rickety Antiquity, which is actually... It originates from a story, a short story that Heidi wrote for her online page Mm -hmm. years ago. And, like, from the first moment that I read it, I was like, we need to make this into a short film. (laughs) Because the premise was so good. So, I told her that we needed to do that, and she wrote it, and it was amazing, so we're finally filming it. Um... The primary cast for that is Joe Rosing, who's out of the Chicagoland area, I think, around the Chicago area. Wakanda. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is actually, it's not spelled like Wakanda, but yeah, it is. Oh, okay. <laughs> Whenever he said that, my inner Marvel fan kind of freaked out. <laughs> ah, yes. But um, uh, Joe Rosing, Caitlin Skinner, Caitlin's daughter, Ella Skinner. Um, myself and Heidi are going to make cameos. Uh, Kenny Hurtling is in it as well. There's going to be some voiceover from a gentleman named Eric Olson. It's going to be a very fun, very fun little short. Um, and then I have briefly discussed this before, but on my birthday (laughs) of all times, we are going to be working on a short film called No Paradise, which is, uh, initially I wrote it about a year ago, and then uh, about two weeks ago or so, I can't remember exactly how long, I decided to go back to it. I rewrote parts of it, I restructured it a little bit, Um, I made it less of an expositional piece, for example. Um, I also changed the ending, but I'm really excited to film this one. Uh, The only thing that I'll say about it is uh, it's going to be a haunted house short that has family drama done differently than what you normally see. Haunted house, sign me up. Yeah, I said the same thing. (laughs) (laughs) I, I want to stress, though, because there's a lot of haunted house pieces out there. There's a lot of family dynamics that are shown in these movies. What I have written genuinely is a standout from those. I wanted to do something that has not been explored that often, if ever. And I'm very, very proud of what I did writing this. Um, And then just a little quick recap of Cincinnati Horror Hound, which I went to. I had to miss it out. Oh, you were going to go? I wanted to. You missed Uh, that and Comic-Con. Yeah, oh. I, had to, I had to work yesterday. Uh, Indiana had a Comic Con, and um, unfortunately, I had to you work missed it. Hayden Christensen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we talked about I, it last I night. <laughs> other, a few other friends got to meet them, so yeah. But that's okay. Th- they'll it never rub it in. <laughs> yeah. Um, Cincinnati Horror Hound was an absolute blast. Um, the only critique that I have of it really is that it was set up a little bit differently mm-hmm. than Indianapolis. Um. The way that they structured the walkways made it a little unnecessarily congested, but I'm 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 curious if they maybe did that because of the fact that it was a smaller venue. I don't know where they've been before this year. Mm-hmm. Um, it did seem like a smaller location than Indianapolis. I was gonna say I think they moved locations from where they had it before. I, I think that they did. I'm just not sure the size difference. Because I'm assuming they had it where they had Comic Con in Cincinnati mm-hmm. before. Yeah, I. It's weird that Cincinnati would have a smaller venue, but. Yeah, it. I mean, it's not that it was small. Mm. It, it's just that for, it, they had they had a lot set up. <laughs> yeah. And uh, like they even had they they had two different spots where you could meet mm. the celebrities. Uh, for example, because there was so much vendor wise. Um, There's always so much vendor wise at the, Horror Hound, any Horror Hound, really. The selection, it, it seemed a little redundant. There was a lot of like, there was a lot of the same, mm-hmm. uh, which is fine. Just, you know, just more options, I suppose. Yeah. 
Um, but I got to meet. Did this look like the same place, or is this a different place? Um, it was probably a, it was a little smaller, I think. So this is not the same place. No, that it's definitely not. Okay, so yeah, they didn't move locations. Um, but no, I uh, I got to meet the uh, two girls from the new Exorcist movie. Cool. Um, they were really cool to meet and very eager to talk about horror specifically. <laughs> um, that was uh, that was fun to have the conversation like that. Um, Dylan, pass it, pass it. Here we go. Oh, nice. <laughs> okay, I get you. I get you. Sick. Uh-huh. Why do you always do the same smile in your pictures? <laughs> like every single one, you 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 have the same face. I do. Yes. I mean, I guess he's not wrong. <laughs> I've never noticed. Yeah. Compare it to the picture that you have in your living room. <laughs> After this. Anyways, go ahead. Sorry. You better be. <laughs> <laughs> you better be. Damn, John, I'm actually a little impressed with that. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. That was decent. Cheers. Not up to par with me, but close enough. <laughs> close uh, enough is good. Enough. No. Good God. So anyway, um, after I met them, um, now I want to say like a large part of why I went was because I wanted to meet Jane Levy, mm. um, because I love Evil Dead and she is genuinely my favorite actress. Uh, she unfortunately canceled like literally last minute. And they have not, they have not yet announced why. I don't know if they will. Um, I know like Mike Flanagan and Kate Siegel dropped out, and they said it was due to film. I, I saw uh, them. Okay. I saw them at one of the horror hounds. <clears throat> I, I'm sure that they'll be at another one. They might even be at the one in September. I assume. Yeah. Also, um, I'd love to meet them. They're amazing. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> I, I H- Hush is one of my I favorite got to see movies. Multiple yeah. panels with them. So. Um. So, unfortunately, I did not get to meet Jane. Um, but after after I met Lydia and Olivia, um, let me scroll back through my pictures. I actually got to meet up with my friend Chelsea Watkins, who's an actress. Mm. Um, and then, <laughs> um, y'all know Halloween ends. Oh yeah, I saw that. Mm-hmm. I uh I got to meet Rohan Campbell. Nice. Who is genuinely the nicest celebrity I've ever met. That's cool. Very it did cool. not feel like I was meeting a celebrity. It felt like I was meeting with one of the boys to get a drink. <laughs> it was an amazing, amazing time nice. talking with him. Um, you know, talking about his work, my work. Um, apparently, how we both look good in the color purple. <laughs> <laughs> um. Super, super nice guy. Could not recommend meeting him anymore. He is amazing. And then I got to meet Michael Myers himself. James Jude Courtney. Oh, nice. I fangirled, and I have a picture of me holding the Michael Myers mask while he is holding the Harvester mask. <laughs> cool. Let's go. Yeah. That's cool. Which he was shockingly really eager to do. <laughs> um, I, I didn't know if that would come off as tacky or not. Right, right. That's um, really cool, though. Yeah, that's awesome. I, uh, this one is going to be kind of painful for me to say, because I've been a fan of this man for literally most of my life, at least 85%. And I was so disappointed whenever I met him. Mick Foley from WWE. Oh. Cactus Jack, Mankind, Dude Love. Um, whenever I met him, now keep in mind this is somebody that inspired me to wrestle because he, he he I mean he's not as big as me but he is a bigger guy. So whenever whenever you see a bigger guy wrestle you're like I wonder if I can do that. <laughs> uh for me that was Mick Foley and Bray Wyatt that got me into wrestling. Anyway. So I go up and I'm I'm talking to him and you know I'm trying to make small talk telling him you know the different ways that he inspired me halfway through my sentence. He's like, hold on a second. And he takes out his phone and starts texting. Oh, God. And then he sends a voice clip. And on top of that, you paid money to meet him. I did. 
I did. You're, now, pay, you're paying money to spend a few minutes with him, and yeah, he I can't mean, even, even be bothered. even if it's only a couple minutes, you know, just to tell him my story, him say whatever, um, you know. But the fact that he spent probably a collective minute and a half <laughs> on his phone, yeah, I would like sure. to give him the benefit of the doubt. Because I mean he's not a he's not known for horror he's known for wrestling so it might not have been his crowd but that still wasn't an excuse, nope. you know if you're if you're making an appearance and somebody is literally giving you money to meet you mm. and you do that it it just it left a sour taste in my mouth I would like to try to meet him again one day perhaps at a wrestling convention just to see if it's different purely to see if it's different yeah, yeah. that's fair. Um, cause I've never heard any stories like that about him before. So, um, just an odd occurrence, I hope, but that I was actually going to leave it at that, but I, I couldn't leave on such a sour note. <laughs> and I, I knew Heather Donahue was going to be there from Blair Witch Project. Yeah. Um, but I felt like because she doesn't do a lot of appearances and she's basically a hermit, <laughs> um, <laughs> I felt like that she was probably going to be the most expensive one there. She was the least expensive. I ha- that seems right. Twenty dollars um, for a picture. That was it. Hmm. That was it. <laughs> um, I mean, she, it doesn't seem like she's the type of person that would expect that much from others, you know. Especially one hundred percent agree. From a movie that came out like ninety nine, almost, almost right? thirty years mm-hmm. ago yeah. at this point. Fuck you, we're that 20, means I'm almost 30. We're, actually, uh, <laughs> we're getting there, we're getting there. <laughs> Let's Both not... of you, shut up. Hey, I'm sorry, old man Walker, we... my bad. A man who sold, his last name has to be Walker. <laughs> anyway, um... We'll get off your so... lawn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, John finally so... said he's getting into his age. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I whenever I saw that I could logistically meet Heather Donahue without killing my bank account, um, I decided to, and she was an absolute, absolute sweetheart. One of the nicest people I met. Um, she saw my necklace, the one that Heidi gave me, that has myself and my mother from Christmas 2012 on it, and like she asked about it, asked who was in it. I told her the story. You know, how my mother got me into horror, how she raised me on it, you know, showed me Blair Witch Project Project whenever I was like four. <laughs> and uh, I thought she was going to cry. You know, that that's how personable she was. Mm-hmm. You know, not even just with me, but with other fans, too. She took her time with everyone. Um, if you ever do get to meet Heather Donahue, you should. <laughs> if you ever have the opportunity to meet her, you should, Donna, do that. <laughs> That was really dumb. Um, hold on, hold on. I, uh, <laughs> right, I think I closed out of it. <laughs> um, I, All 203. <laughs> I, uh, I met up with uh, my friend Jessa, who is an actress. Um, Jessa still Daisy. Haven't, still haven't met her. Um, we'll be working with her and Sister Sullivan, at least. Oh, cool. Um, always a fun time whenever... We get to interact at conventions. And then I met Ken Forey. Nice. Super I, nice I, guy. I actually, I met him too um, a, few year, a couple of years ago. Yeah. He's a really nice guy. Yes. Um, I Let's just say that there's a couple things in the works. Really? I'll tell you after we conclude recording. Because is he acting anymore? I'm not sure if he's acting, but I'll fill you in. Mm. Okay. Um. Overall, Horror Hound was a very solid experience, just like last year in Indianapolis. Um, I know that they're not going to be in Indy again this year. They're actually going to be in Cincinnati again in September, I think. So, uh, depending on who is going to be there, I might try to go again, but I am going to Scarefest in October, so I might have to (laughs) skip this one. Um, Like I said, just depending on who. Um, Scarefest, Matthew Loward's going to be there. Mm-hmm. 
That's one of those ones that, like, I would probably travel to Nashville for, even if it was only to meet him. Okay, I'm joining you. <laughs> <laughs> I want to meet him so I've bad. I've seen him on multiple occasions, you know. He God. he just seems like a really nice yes, guy. He really does. I, I'm curious, because he will obviously have a very long line. I'm curious how personable very. he'll be with everyone. He seems super personal. I see videos of him all yeah. the time on t- uh, on TikTok embracing fans because they start yeah. crying at, uh, because they met him. And, like, it, it's not just because of, like, his work on I, I'm not going to lie. Like Scream, but, like, also Scooby-Doo. And... Yeah, I, I'm not going to lie. You know, that he might be the one celebrity that I would actually tear up meeting. I was he gonna might say, be the one. I was going to say, like, that sounds awesome, man. <laughs> Like, man. <laughs> Holy shit. That was really good. Yeah, yeah that was really good. <laughs> that was frighteningly good. I'm trying to actively work on it. <laughs> now we need to do like a audio bit where uh, I'm Scooby or Shaggy. I'm so fine with that. <laughs> oh my God. Like Scoob. Patreon content. Hi, <laughs> Shaggy. Do you have some Scooby snacks? What was that? <laughs> That was Scooby Doo. Okay, dude. that wasn't bad. <laughs> yeah, th- <laughs> thank you, Garrett. Rex is a monster. <laughs> like Scoob, you're right. <laughs> hey, my coworkers thought I did good when I was doing Scooby Doo. So, <laughs> but was that all you got? Oh uh, yeah, that was pretty much it. Um, uh, I, I'm super excited to get these short films out there. Of course, we're continuing. Where and lies continue. Yeah, I'm s- still busy editing. I don't know if that funeral time, scene. I'm not gonna have time to finish it this week. That funeral scene is it, probably... It is coming in good. <laughs> um, I just have to do more, some more things to it, and work is going to be murder this yeah. week. Yeah. Mm. Uh, don't forget, before we go, uh, digital copy giveaway. Don't forget, next week we will announce the winner for anyone that hashtag Maz Morales. So again, good yeah. luck to you all. When's the 100% deadline? Is it like midnight on Saturday, or...? And, um, I would say midnight Saturday. Okay, yeah. Okay. Midnight Saturday. And that's when it'll end, and we will do the drawing Satur- by the time we do our recording. Saturday night at 11.59.59. Yes. Okay. Uh, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. Make sure to share. Uh, drop us a rating on audio platforms if that's how you're listening. Yep. Um, um, uh, make sure to recommend us out. It, help, it helps boost our audience a lot, and it allows us to be able to create more content for you. Uh, yeah. Uh, give us feedback. Uh, per- yes. Negative, positive, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Um, a lot of people have been giving feedback uh, uh, on last week's video, and we've been trying to, <clears throat> you know, uh, respond to that and uh, take, um, you know, re- take that criticism. I, um. I've been doing some more work on the channel. Um, we've we've been putting up some, uh, putting more ev- effort into the thumbnails, and um, I think that's gonna drive more uh, more attention to us. And uh, we hope you guys enjoy the rest of uh, content coming. Yes, uh, like John said with the giveaway, um, you can hashtag Miles Morales on the official post for the giveaway. Uh, that will get you one entry. And if you share, retweet, whatever, you get another entry, a bonus entry. Yep. And we will pull them out of that. We'll pull names out of a hat next week again during the episode. Yep. Uh, Can we pull them from my cowboy hat? I like the face down our face. Yeah, I like that idea actually. My cowboy hat. Yeah, let's do it. Hell let's yeah. Do it. Okay, we'll switch between hats back and forth. Okay. Okay. So, so we'll see you all next week for another fun, fun episode. Whatever we're gonna do. Yep. See you, see next you guys. Week. guys. Okay. God bless. See ya. been the Cinema Asylum Podcast. You guys were awesome. Thanks for coming out. Good night.